Hello and welcome to Share Your Secrets, a podcast that celebrates the diversity of food, art and community. We're Bounce Back Food CIC, a community cookery school that has been fighting food poverty in Greater Manchester, Cheshire and North Wales since 2014. Earlier this year we started working on our second fundraising recipe book, Secret Dishes from Around the World 2. It has exciting recipes from 20 countries and 20 original pieces of art by 20 local artists. In each episode, you'll find out about two of the 20 countries that will feature in the book. We'll talk food, art and community with the artists involved, get insights from guests in the featured countries and keep you up to date with what the Bounce Back team have been up to. I'm your host, Miriam Rendell. I hope you enjoy listening. So, this week on Share Your Secrets, I'll be talking to Jack Whiteleg, a graphic designer based in Manchester. Jack was assigned the Lebanon section of Secret Dishes from Around the World too. I'll also be talking to Felix Padilla, who's based in Trinidad. He's the founder of Simply Trini Cooking. But before we talk to them, I spoke to Duncan about the exciting competition that Bounce Back are currently running. So we've just launched our ultimate cook-along giveaway competition, which is an incredible opportunity to win uh, copies of Secret Dishes from Around the World, book one and two, a ticket to one of our online cook-alongs, which covers your entire household and also 12 months of membership to our community cookery school which means you get access to our online cooking and nutrition portal so loads of fantastic prizes uh, worth 100 pounds so how can you enter this fantastic competition so you can enter on any of our social media channels so facebook twitter instagram on each of the platforms there's a slightly different way to enter so on facebook um, you have to tag a friend in the comment section of the post And each new comment and tag counts as a new entry. So you can enter multiple times, which is great. And you also just have to like our Facebook page. It's a very similar thing on Instagram. And then Twitter, you just have to retweet and again, tag someone in the comments um, in order to enter the competition. So what's the closing date? When do we have to get the entries in by? So the competition closes on the 11th of October and we'll announce the winner across our social media on Monday the 12th. So good luck. Yes, good luck. Thanks, Duncan. Before I introduce our first guest, we felt we should say that this interview was recorded in July 2020, before the devastating explosion in Beirut. Our hearts go out to all those seriously affected by the blast, and we sincerely hope that, like you'll hear in the podcast, Beirut will rebuild and recover in the years to come. Jack Whiteleg is a graphic designer based in Manchester and one of the co-founders of OK Creative. I started by asking him to tell me about some of his latest projects. So I've been doing quite a big rebrand for a local dog charity um, called Dogs for Rescue. That's hoping to launch pretty soon, so that's been quite exciting. I started illustrating dogs, and that's sort of what led on to the uh, Dogs for Rescue project. Because I've seen on your Instagram, there's lots of lovely like portraits of dogs, there's some cats on there. Yeah, tell me more about it. We were just sort of exploring different styles and things like that, and I just thought I'd draw my dogs i got three dogs so i drew them and then i posted that on facebook and things and got quite a lot of commission out of it so i just carried on doing them so what type of dogs are your three dogs we've got a chihuahua cross of a pomeranian um a beagle cross of a cocker and a springer spaniel what i love about the drawings that you've done is that you can see the character of the animal in your artwork so has that led to people wanting portraits of their own pets yeah so most of the ones i've done have been other people's pets i've even done a lizard which was quite fun (laughs) do you have a photograph when you do those drawings or is it just from memory most of the time um i have some photographs they're not necessarily sort of straight on it's i've just got to sort of interpret their like their key features and make that sort of simplified portrait of them because they're really nice things to have up in your house, aren't they? They're, they make really nice artwork. Yeah, lots of things so anyway. <laughs> so with the dog portraits, um, are they being collated for a specific project? It started off as sort of commissions for clients and things. And then I was approached by Dogs for Rescue, who are 
a local charity. They're actually the UK's first kennel free rescue. So really? all of their dogs sleep in a house with all of the dogs. So they're not in kennels or separated at all. And they're doing really well at the moment. I think their social media has blown up recently. They asked me, I think, just to do a leaflet or something. And I went and had a meeting with them and spoke to them about everything. And they really liked the illustrations that I was doing. And they were interested in a full rebrand. We've had a really nice idea with the branding because because the dogs are kennel free, they just find footprints everywhere, like in the house, on the tables and things. So it's really inspired by that. So we've made this sort of brand identity that's just covered in paw prints and things. But we've actually used the paw prints from the dogs. So we got their muddy paws. Aww. We got them to come in and walk across pieces of paper. So it's been a really nice project. <laughs> and how personal to create that branding <laughs> around something that's so unique to them. Yeah, because they're all about being different to the other dog rescues. So making something really unique to them has been a really important part of it. So let's talk about some of the other projects that you've been working on. Um, so I noticed that you've done some artwork for the Deaf Institute, a music venue in Manchester. Yeah, it's quite sad that they might be closing now, but I heard that quite a few people are interested in buying it, so hopefully someone snaps it up. There's a, a weekly event called Lean and Bop. It's the biggest student club night in Manchester. It's just like hip-hop, and they wanted to do a nice club night like so you don't have to get dressed up and it's just about the music really yeah we worked with them to sort of create a range of illustrations and some more branding and a new logo and things like that it really stands out i love the color palette that you went for yeah so their original one was like a really bright pink and a really sort of neon blue like a cyan color and we just sort of toned that down a bit sort of complement it a bit more and were you working on posters or was it wristbands the main thing that we did for them was the logo and the illustrations for them to use. The wristbands and things are more of a guide and sort of show them what they could do and how it could be used across the brand. Talk to me about Larder because I noticed you'd been working alongside a cafe. Yeah, so the Larder was, they had this sort of vision of opening a really nice coffee shop. We got to get involved and help with the name generation and the whole style of the, the shop. And as well, because it was before lockdown, we could actually go and meet up and go to the place and help pick out colour schemes and even the light fittings we helped decide on. Sounds really hands-on. So you've done all of these projects through the agency that you've set up. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so me and my friend who's, who's also a student, we went to Pendleton College for the first two years, so we were only like 16, 17. We were both in the same year, but we hardly ever spoke to each other. And then when I went back, so two years later, we were both in the same class. So we got chatting and then we've sort of been pretty close mates ever since. We used to just joke about how some design agencies that do work on that great and we could do better than that so we just decided to set something up and go for it really sort of the name all cracked comes from that so it's actually some believe anyway it's the origin of the word okay all correct yeah and it, it started off as a joke in old newspapers so only people sort of in the know knew what it meant. So we took that sort of thing of how it was started off as a little joke between friends and came something so big and mm. probably one of the most well-known words in the world. Yeah, we say it all the time. <laughs> yeah, so everyone knows all oh, correct, okay. So we were quite inspired by how adaptable and usable the word okay is and try and create brands in the same way and make them sort of adaptable and sort of set up to grow as a business. So when was this set up then? Um, we started doing it as sort of our final project in second year of uni. I was looking the other day actually and we've actually been registered as a company for a year this month. And you're moving forward in terms of your brand and your name. Is that right? Over lockdown, you've recently rebranded. Yeah, so we got a bit sick of telling people how to spell or correct on emails and things. So we decided <laughs> to uh, change to just shorten it to okcreative.agency. In a way, it's sort of the same thing that all correct became okay. So we've done the same thing. Yeah, you've had a similar journey, but it's cool that that's where it stemmed from. Yeah. Like, I never knew that about 
Okay. And so what is it that you're wanting to do moving forward? We're hoping to get a few more clients in and just carry on doing what we're doing really and building brands and that's what I want to do. Do you focus on marketing or advertising or both or logos? What is it that you prefer doing? We started off with like logo design and little things like that but through uni we have got the skills and stuff to do advertising campaigns and build full-on brand identities and yeah that would be the nice thing to do is get some big brands who want the full package. And you've already got quite a few clients on your books already how did you get those how did they hear about you a lot of the time it has been through social media just reaching out to people and talking to people are you still studying at uni i've just finished my degree i guess uni life changed a bit because of covid we went away just before all the covid thing happened and then we got back all sort of excited to carry on and finish the degree and college was closed so how have you been coping in lockdown how does it work for you working at home been lucky enough My dad's had quite a lot of time. He's built a shed in the back garden and we've turned that into our new office. Oh, nice. Have you come up with any new routines or traditions during lockdown? It's quite a strange one, really, because in lockdown, we've gone from getting up and having uni Zoom calls to graduating to, right, we need a full time job now, all in the space of two months. You've been going through a lot of life changes. Yeah, it's not really settled in yet, I don't think. I suppose if uni life had carried on as usual, then maybe you wouldn't have made your office in the garden. Yeah, I don't think we'd have had that sense of urgency to get it all sorted and start doing something. Have you felt creatively stunted in lockdown? Have you had days where you're just like, oh, I've just got no inspiration or has it been the opposite? I think having the time not being in uni and things... I've like covered the garden with pieces of paper and just started throwing paint at them and stuff and doing all sorts of making marks. I've just had that time to experiment a bit more. So I'd say I'd been a bit more creative, if anything. Did you get some good results? Yeah, I've actually been using it in quite a lot of my other illustrations that I've been doing. So I've just been making loads of like paint stroke marks and random shapes and things and they've been working out quite nicely in some of my other work. So what kind of illustrations have you been doing recently then? There's an illustrator called Nate Kitch who I've been quite inspired by and I'm just doing some similar stuff to what he does. He's quite political, he's in a lot of newspapers. So you mentioned Nick Kitch as somebody that you follow his work. Are there any other people that inspire you, either in the art world or graphic design? I've always been inspired by David Carson, who's like a pioneer of grunge era of graphic design. And that's always stuck with me, the way that he just breaks the rules of design and basically does what he wants. There's a really famous piece that he did because he used to be the editor of Raygun magazine. And there was a, an interview I can't remember who it was with, but he basically thought the interview was boring. So we put it in a font that no one could read. And how did you find out about Bounce Back? That was on social media as well. Um, I think someone shared it on their story. I just had a look and thought I'd get involved and submit an application. So you heard about Bounce Back and you were offered a place to be part of the book. How was that first meeting? Yeah, it was really exciting. I've very rarely been selected to do things. like I always enter competitions and stuff online and I never usually get picked. So I was really like pleased and happy to be involved. As part of the podcast, we're going to reveal which country you were assigned. Would you like to tell us which it was? Yeah, so the country I was assigned was Lebanon. Right, so you're at the meeting, you're giving your envelope, it says Lebanon, what's your first thought? Um, originally, when I first looked at it, I was a bit like, uh, where's that? But then I was thinking, there's this, this Lebanese food, and yeah, I didn't know much about it though, so it's been quite a fun project to research and find out about. How do you start your creative process? I tend to just Google things and have a research, uh, look into a bit about the culture. And I was thinking, what can I draw? I'm trying to think, could I do a portrait of someone? So I was looking at um, famous Lebanese celebrities and thinking of drawing Keanu Reeves because he was actually born in Lebanon. But I wasn't sure if that would go along with the book. So that was your first thought. Then where, where did you go to after that? I just had a, a look a bit deeper into sort of their culture and... I was looking at the city of Beirut, the capital city. Uh, quite interestingly, 
Beirut has actually been rebuilt seven times. It's been sort of burnt down and rebuilt. So it's referred to as a phoenix. That's why I thought it was such a strong point. I couldn't really let that one slide. Yeah, started sort of sketching out some ideas. Yeah, you're right. It's known as the urban phoenix, isn't it? So yeah, that's a really cool starting point. Yeah, so I just started sort of pencil and paper and just draw out a few like different layout options and different styles of phoenixes and things. And then I take the strongest ones and sort of take a photo of them and then just start working on them in Adobe Illustrator. How do you build it up from there? In Adobe Illustrator, I just use my trackpad on the laptop to just use the pen tool and draw the shapes. And what's nice with working digitally as well is that you don't have to do loads of different copies of versions. You can just draw up to a stage and then make a copy of it. And so you don't have to draw it again and again. Just copy it, carry on working, copy it until you get the final piece. I noticed on the body of the phoenix, there's almost like a a mosaic pattern in the background. Was that something that you drew from the culture? Yeah, so I was looking at like shops and sort of walls and things in Lebanon and they have quite a lot of patterns and mosaic Mm. tiles. So I tried to incorporate those sort of shapes and patterns on the tail of the phoenix. That's inspired by a bit of the pattern and the background as well. That's inspired by the shapes and the the mosaics. And your use of light as well. I really liked how it reflects on the body and kind of like it's got an aura around it. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Uh, Yeah, I just thought the phoenix is something that is supposed to be on fire. So having the light bounce off it makes it look like that thing is rising. It's coming out of the ashes, isn't it? It's being reborn. So have you got a name for it? Maybe something like from the ashes or something like that would be quite nice. (laughs) I mean, your piece of artwork is so striking. It looks victorious to me, like the colours that you went for. Are you pleased with the final result? Yeah, I was pretty happy with it, yeah. Yeah, it's nice and bright and like you said, it's quite striking. I also thought that, you know, you've been doing this in lockdown It's quite symbolic of how we've had to rebuild our lives. Yeah, maybe that's something that's come out of lockdown for you. Yeah, it could reflect that, actually. Um, I didn't think of it like that, but yeah, it's a really nice sort of thought process behind it. You'll be able to look back at this time and like, yeah, this is something that you created during lockdown. I think that's a really nice thing to take away. Yeah, nice, especially when I'm older as well to look back and see, because I'm sure people will be talking about it in the future, because... I don't think many people have lived through something like this. It'd be nice to have the book like in the future as well as something to remember the year by. It's been wonderful talking to you today, Jack. Um, If we wanted to find your work and if we wanted to follow OK Creative Agency or get in contact about future projects, how could we do that? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is at jackwhiteleg.design and OK Creatives is at okcreative.agency and it's the same for the web address brilliant well thank you so much for taking the time to chat this morning it's been really really interesting and i I wish you the best of luck moving forward with okay creative agency thanks i appreciate it it's been great earlier this year at bounce back food we ran our annual social enterprise internship the program ran remotely which enabled 20 young people from across the uk to join our team everyone was assigned one of the 20 countries that features in the book Here's Carter with some fun facts about Lebanon. A Lebanese host will always encourage you to eat a little more. Sharing food with people they care about is one of the essential, joyful parts of life. Who wouldn't be grateful to bring delight to friends and family? Lebanon has 16 bank holidays a year. The UK has only eight. Now let's hear from Joe and Louise to hear a little bit more about Trinidad and Tobago. Did you know the limbo was created in Trinidad? Trinidad is sometimes called the land of the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds feature on the national coat of arms, the currency and the passport. Did you know that Tobago is absolutely tiny? It's only 26 miles long and 7 miles wide. Did you know that Tobago was first sighted by Columbus in 1498? Since then the island has been fought over by numerous nations numerous times. Thanks to our interns for sharing those facts. The artist assigned to Trinidad and Tobago is Emma Reynolds. She is a children's book illustrator based in Manchester. She is inspired by nature, animals, adventure and seeing the magic in every day. She focused her artwork on the fresh, mouth-watering ingredients found in the recipes for Trinidad and Tobago. For more information about Emma's work, check out the episode notes on Bounce Back Foods blog.
Felix Padilla lives in Trinidad and is the founder of Simply Trini Cooking. I started by asking him how life was in Trinidad. It's raining outside, a lot of rain. <laughs> no way, it's sunny in the UK. That should be the other way around. Strange but true. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about Simply Trini Cooking. Simply Trini Cooking is my journey into our cooking experience, our Trini food, the culinary, I would say, the history of our, our cooking traditions, you know, and I just sought to document all of these recipes for everyone to enjoy, you know, in a simple manner. And I found the website being a, a wonderful media to share that experience with others. Have you always enjoyed cooking? Um, yeah, um, ever since growing up as a young boy, you know, I, I remember one of my first experiences, you know, frying an egg and I cracked the egg and maybe some of the shell fell into the pot as well. <laughs> and I remember as a little boy, my mom showed me how to do those things. <laughs> <laughs> but again, with experience, with age comes, you know, the skill. So I was able to you know, master that simple thing. And growing up, I've been, you know, looking back and I've seen that flair for cooking has been there. It's only later on in my life I really discovered, well, hey, I really seem to have, you know, something going here. So I decided to explore it. Absolutely. So how did you set it up? Where did you start? Well, back then, 2007, I started using Blogspot, you know, that Google um, platform, mm -hmm. and not having any experience, any sort of know-how, how to build a website, I started from scratch. I had to learn as I go along, customize a template to suit me. Well, now, you know, 12 years into the, I'll say into the game, I am now using WordPress as my platform. And that's, that's a whole new, different, um, I would say, kettle of fish altogether. Because now I'm dealing with plugins and stuff. T different teams, responsive teams. As you are blogging, the experience, the, the skills will come eventually. So you don't need to be a master of anything before you start. You just, you know, you will gather these skills as you go along. I think it's fantastic the way that you're archiving all of these recipes that have been passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So the recipes I didn't even know about. Again, is people talking to me. Some of the, I would say the older heads, they give me um, ideas. Some of them will ask me questions. Um, so do you have so and so um, recipe on your website? I said no. You know, why don't you show me how to do it? I will, I will document it. <laughs> and it really is very well documented. You've got step-by-step yeah. -step instructions. The pictures are really clear. That must have taken quite a lot of time. Yes, it did. The process, of course, starts with knowing what recipe you have to do. Then, of course, you have the shopping to get the ingredients. And of course, you have to set up the camera. My way of doing it, I like free form, so I don't have a stand because it's like action photos. So while I'm cooking, I have my camera at my side and every step I'll take a shot, you know? Work in progress. Yes, yes. And then afterwards we have to edit the photos, we have to upload, compress the images. It is a lot of work, but in the end, when people try the recipes, it is very accurate because I I'm very detailed when I'm doing my work, mm, mm. down to the last minute, if I am checking the time, so how long you have to sort it, something, I'll be counting, you know, down to the last minute. So when you get a recipe from, from my website, you are getting something that anyone can recreate in their own kitchen afterwards. What is your favorite recipe on the website, if you had to choose one? Ah, there's so many favorites. <laughs> Well, I like to eat simple, so I will always gravitate towards the simpler dishes, uncomplicated, okay. few ingredients, and you can cook in maybe less than half an hour. So one of my favorite, since even my childhood days, is what we call smoked herring and dumpling. Mm. So that is a preserved fish which is imported. I think it's from Norway. They, they smoked the fish, the herrings. It had a nice dark color and it lasts very well. Again, it, this is a throwback into, I would say, yesteryear when, you know, people were, you know, they didn't have a lot. 
so they depend on these types of ingredients because they didn't have any um, refrigerators so this this would have lasted very long that fish will be just prepared with tomatoes and we have a pepper we call it seasoning pepper or pimento it's very mild and gives the dish a really nice flavor with all the heat right oh cool and then of course we have the dumplings it's a nice simple dish i always liked it you know if i get the chance i will always cook it as well <laughs> It sounds delicious. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh -huh. Now, on your website, you mentioned about Pacro water. You sure you want to know about it? <laughs> Pacro water, it's a, it's a drink made from Pacro. We call it Pacro, but um, it's a mollusk called um, Chiton. The fishermen, they find it on the rocks and they just use their knives and, and pry it out. And what we do, we'll boil that and the water from it, we will use to make the drink. We will season it to our taste, a little salt, you know, our favorite herb, shadow benny, and a little pepper. And it is drunk, it's, it's a man's drink. Mm. If you understand, it's, it is considered an aphrodisiac. A, a lot of fishermen, you know, when they know you have pakro water, they will hung you down and because they know of it. It's a drink that a lot of fishermen know of. Right, cool. I mean, it's so interesting to hear about it. What about mother-in-law? That's another one I've read about. Okay, mother-in-law is, it's basically a spicy salad. Right. It's East Indian influenced. It's used as a condiment when you're having your food. Let's say you, ha you have a, a dish of rice, a little bit of dal, some jira pork. Instead of pepper, some people will use the mother-in-law because it's just as hot. It's just as spicy. I find it delicious. I have a high tolerance for heat, so I will always enjoy it. <laughs> I think it might blow my head off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what recipes um, would you say are traditional to Trinidad if you had to pick a couple that you associate with cooking in Trinidad and Tobago? There's so much. Well, see, some of the dishes, to me, there's a common chord amongst, not just Trinidad alone, but some of the other Caribbean islands. I don't know if it's because of the slavery influence, that sort of background, but I've seen it throughout some of the islands. So we would have the provision, which are the ground tubers, like cassava and yam, sweet potato, mm. and some sort of side. So like how I said, the dumpling and smoke herring, mm. right? So they'll have provision with um, either smoke herring, salt fish, stew fish, maybe even stew chicken, pork, basic dishes. Mm. Because of the East Indian influence, we also have dishes like the rotis, all the different rotis with the curries. One I think is very Trinidadian in its um, roots is the doubles. That's popular street food everyone knows about. That has been invented in Trinidad and Tobago. It started way back in the 1930s and now it's become a very popular dish in Trinidad and I see even worldwide. Mm. The thing is, we have so many influences into our cooking that when it comes to traditional, they'll be traditional based on ethnicity because of the mixing of the races. You know, everyone coming together to form this nation. We will have certain dishes that everyone will have some affinity to. We have the dishes that is, is neither of one ethnicity or the other, but it's like a mix of many ethnicities. Yeah, so many influences. What kind of dishes would you be making for a celebration with friends? It depends. If you're hanging out, we see we lime in. If we lime in, we have the, what I, what I term the lime in foods, you know, the cutters. Because when, when we're liming, of course, men we will be drinking. And most people, myself included, we don't like to have alcohol on an empty stomach. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have foods like um, jira pork and hops. Hops is a, well, hops bread. It's a, a bread we make in Trinidad. The recipe is on the website. We'll have the sauce. I think that is English um, influence, you know, European influence, where we took pig foot, the gelatinous parts of the animal. So that would include pig foot, cow heel, cow skin, chicken foot. You know, we'll make that into a sauce where we'll boil the, the parts yeah. and then season it, have it in a, a seasoned water with lime and everything. 
and after three hours of really soaking the, the flavor is infused into everything of course we must have some pepper in that actually i think the reason why we would eat like that because it is said that pepper cuts the alcohol so mm -hmm. You may not get as drunk as fast. If you're lining with friends, one of the quickest ways of preparing any dish will be like a pilau, which is a one pot rice dish with, with meat and the rice and everything. It's very simple, it's easy to make, it's a one pot, so not too much of dishes to wash up when you're finished. It all depends on what is the occasion, you know, what time of year. So what about if you've got a sweet tooth? Sweet tooth. I try to stay away from those things. <laughs> I'm not much of a sweet tooth. I'm a self-professed um, salty and sour. <laughs> Peppery. Okay. Yeah. But sweet tooth, we have currant roll. We have the different pastries like coconut turnovers. I guess this one will have more of an international influence. Like Easter time, we'll have the um, hot cross buns. Oh, really? Okay. The sweet bread, all the coconut sweet breads. If you're thinking along the lines of um, East Indian sweets, we have barfi, we have parasad. You, you will really have, a, have a, a time in Trinidad if you have a sweet tooth. There's so many, there's so many. Oh, kurma, jalebi. Oh, the, the list goes on, the list goes on. Good for me. <laughs> Where would you go and source all of your ingredients? Well, it'll be a mix, you know, some supermarkets will have stuff, but if you want it really cheaper, you will have to go to the market, get better deals at the market, you know, you can even see how fresh the produce is because it's right in front of you. I always like the market. For me, it's dear to me because um, at a young age, oh, 11, 12, I had the experience of selling in the market. I have an aunt who sold in the market for a number of years she had her own area and stuff so everyone knew her so i just tagged along and i enjoyed the experience so if i'm looking for fresh produce i prefer to go to the market do you cook outside a lot what, what we will find us doing um during the dry season is we'll have a lot of again if you're liming hanging out we like to go to the rivers or even the beaches but mostly rivers so if someone is inviting you to a river lime, know that you'll be seeing someone cooking. So it'll either be tree stones and firewood, or some people have modernized and they, they work with their, what we call firecrackers. Not the real firecracker, that, that's, that, that's what we call the stove. It, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of ring stove, and they work with the ring stove and their gas tanks and we will work with all the ingredients and cook. Yeah. So again, a simple dish. You might be making dumpling and curry chicken or a little pilau, all by the, the river. So we are having a good time, listening to some good music, enjoying the water, and of course, we have the food. It sounds like that's one of the ways communities come together, by liming. Uh, yes, it's part of us. It's part of our culture. I can't see it in any other way. I think every single celebration you can think of in Trinidad, there's always the food association that goes with it. Tell me about any festivals that you have in Trinidad. We have so many, <laughs> so many festivals, so many celebrations. Of course, there's Carnival. Carnival, even though it's two days, the Carnival Monday and Tuesday, festivities start way before, maybe a week or two before. I'll say even before that. Let's say from New Year's, we'll have a lot of fets and then we have the official opening of the festivities where we'll have the different competitions, King and Queen of Carnival, then we have the Calypsos. I want to know more about the Kings and Queens of Carnival. How do you become a King or a Queen? What do you have to do? Well, first of all, the Kings and Queens are from bands and the owner will choose someone and most of the time it will be somebody who's experienced doing it already. What you will have is a larger costume, very big, sometimes 
a good few feet in the air it's very very big all right and we'll have one for of course the king and one for the queen and during the judging night we have that competition that's where you see all the the flair you know some people they use fireworks it's really beautiful it's colorful if you're a photographer you will enjoy taking all those sort of pictures and some of them i, I have to say the creativity that I have seen in my lifetime in carnival arts, it's really amazing. I and all am, you know, in awe that these people could take these simple things, organic materials, maybe a leaf, a palm frond, feathers, and just put this together into one amazing creation. What time of year is that? Carnival, how it's worked out, it is always the two days before Ash Wednesday, which begins Lent in the Catholic calendar. And the Calypso competition, so is that music and dancing? Mostly um, singing. What we'll find happening is that over the years, the music has evolved. So now we have Calypso being either the old style, what you call Kaiso, and then we have Soka, which is a little more upbeat and faster, a more of a party theme. So the Calypso competition that happens on the Sunday, which you call the Marche Gras, the Calypsos will be of a social commentary type of theme. So most times they will speak about maybe life on the whole, how life was, what is going on in your life. And then there's the political side. Of course, th that is a part of our culture where the Calypsos done in such a way that you may ridicule the ruling party, maybe for something they did the year before. I actually remember some people saying, you know, like, well, if something happened, ah, that'll make a good Calypso boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll make a good Calypso. It's all fun because at the end of the day, no one is singing a Calypso to incite any violence between people. It's just to make fun, have fun. And at the same time, the Calypsonians, they are celebrated for their art form. Yeah, and commenting on what's been happening. Yes. Now, that's the, I would say, the popular Calypsos. If you really want to hear the roots of Kaiso, they're what they call the tents, a Calypso tent. Of course, they will have an, a, a place, um, so they call it a, a tent. Um, that is where you will have not so famous Calypsonians who will come and sing their songs. They have this sort of system where we say paying your dues. You have to pay your dues before you get famous. I think that is something you find in, in, in the music industry, anywhere you go, you know. You can't be a star overnight. So that's where up-and-coming Calypsonians will start from at you know and that is where you will get more of the i hope you're not recording all this <laughs> you'll have more of the the raunchy type of calypsos <laughs> you know the uncensored types you know where they'll talk about relations between man and woman in the in different ways mm -hmm. or something funny you know but more adult but again it's done in a tasteful manner where we use what we call the double entendre, the double meaning. Mm. So anyone listening, especially a Trinidadian because it's the culture, you know exactly what the um, Calypsonian is speaking about. And what kind of food would you find at this kind of festival? That, that's the time where a lot of people take the opportunity to make some extra cash. Some people will already have established businesses, but then there are others, you know, like, you know, little pop-up eateries, whatever you call it, and they will have different finger foods, normal fast foods, together with some of the traditional, according to your taste, maybe how hungry you are. Of course, you'll have the same limon foods I was talking about, the foods like the sauces and the jiras and whatnot. Together with that, according to the time, some people may offer breakfast, breakfast dishes as well mm. because when you're partying especially like for juve that's another celebration in carnival one of my favorites <laughs> you know you'll find people having breakfast so you'll have like corn soup a little fry bake or just the normal um, pot bake with either salt fish if you go in east indian you will have sada roti with a little baigan choker mm. or tomato choker you know, very filling things. It's still light, but filling. You can, can jump up and still enjoy yourself and don't feel too full. 
And of course, our favorite, together with the bake, we have bacon shark. You will find all those things being served. What I've found over the years, because of the Syrian Lebanese influence, we now have a lot of gyros being sold on the streets, which is basically a wrap with meat. Well, my favorite is lamb. I like to have the, the lamb gyro. But of course, they will cater to everyone else. So they have like chicken and beef and whatnot. Just imagine you're having a wonderful time. All this music, we have, because we have lots of large trucks with speakers blasting soca music because we're on the road now. And you are chipping along, following the truck somewhere in Port of Spain and lining the streets. We have bars. We have food. And of course, you'll have company because you have to meet some of your friends or you may go with your friends as well. Mm. Just imagine this big party with everything to your liking all around you. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. It is. It's, it's a wonderful experience. I won't miss it for the world. Every year, I, I have to enjoy my juve. Serious. It's, it's wonderful. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool to hear you talk about it, Felix. It really is. So am I right in saying that you've published these recipes on your blog as a book? Yes, I did. Um, last year in December, I decided to publish the recipes. Over 600 mouth-watering Trini and Trini Fusion recipes. About maybe the fifth year in my blogging experience. I wrote that all in the book, you know. I had people always commenting, sending an email. Hi, I tried a recipe and it was perfect. Do you have a book? <laughs> I'll have to answer in the email. No, unfortunately, but um, I am working on it. So eventually after all this time, I decided now is the time to publish the book. And where can we find it? Oh, it's on Amazon.com right now. I also have it as an ebook as well, so people can download and enjoy. But I, I think the, ex the real experience is having the physical book in front of you. It sounds great. As part of Bounce Back Food, we're developing some of our own recipes with some links to Trinidad. And so what about pineapple chow? Yeah, that's, that's Trini. <laughs> that is Trini. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. I can't get enough of that either. Again, I'm a salty, peppery, sour type of guy. I'm not a sweet tooth. So whenever I see someone selling that at the roadside, I will stop. If not, I will buy my own pineapple and make my own. It's really delicious. So you get all the flavors in, in there. So you get the sweet from the pineapple. Then you get the, the little sour. You know, you get this, the garlic and charabeni combining there. Oh, I'm salivating. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Felix what's next for you you've published your book we can get that online what are you doing this year right now I'm promoting the book locally I am continuing to blog but in the future I, I, I would like to do a book maybe with just as much um, recipes and after that then I will slow down <laughs> Well, it's absolutely amazing talking to you. Thank you for sharing some of the work that you've been doing, the food, the culture of Trinidad. It's just eye-opening and really, really cool to talk to you. So thank you for all of the information that you've shared with us today. No problem. And thank you for taking the time to listen. <laughs> Thanks to Felix for such an amazing interview. Remember, you can pre-order a first edition copy of Secret Dishes from Around the World too from the shop on Bounce Back Foods website. Go to www.bouncebackfood.co.uk forward slash shop to place your order. To find out more about the people featured on today's podcast, head to the blog on Bounce Back Foods website, where you'll find the episode notes. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for listening to Share Your Secrets, a podcast by Bounce Back Food CIC. I'm your host, Miriam Rendell, and I'll see you next week. This episode was sponsored by Astbury Creative, a branding, design and digital marketing agency based in Manchester that specialises in web design, PPC and SEO. They help businesses of all sizes across the Northwest to thrive and grow. Search Astbury Creative and get in touch via their website to discuss your projects.